This current module covers the chapter on sampling distributions in our textbook. We have spent much of the class time so far talking about distributions, but really what we need to be focusing on are sampling distributions. The population distribution is how the data in the population is spread out. A sampling distribution is how the statistics would be spread out as we sample from that population. One of the key terms in this topic is sampling error. This is the idea that the sample statistic is expected to vary from sample to sample. That's a common sense idea. If I took lots of different samples from a large population, I would not expect every sample to produce the same result. In the same way, I would not expect every sample to produce the same result as if I had conducted a census. For example, the mean of a sample of 25 people out of 10,000 would probably not be the same as the mean of the 10,000 in that population. Likewise, different samples of size 25 probably will have different means. In fact, one might actually be surprised to find that the sample mean exactly equals the population mean. In this idea that the sample statistic varies from the population parameter, this is what we refer to as sampling error. Unfortunately, this name is a bit of a misnomer, and a rather misleading one at that. If we don't expect x bar to equal mu, can we justifiably call it error when these numbers, as expected, don't agree? Alas, this is the term that has stuck over the years, and this is what we will use as well. Now, while we don't expect x bar to equal mu, it is reasonable to expect that x bar would be close to or approximately equal to mu. So let's, let's think this through a little further. Let's think about the idea of the average of averages. So let me go ahead and uh, actually, I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and clear my screen here entirely. Let me start fresh here. So let's, th let's look at the average of averages. And I'm using the term kind of very sloppy here, but you know, we don't like, we, it, statisticians don't like the word average. What we're really talking about is the, the distribution of the sample means. All right, so here is my population. So let me draw a sketch of my population. Right, there's the bell curve and we've got the mean. The bell curve is here, All right? Now this is the population. So in the population, I could randomly expect, I might find a value out here I might pick another value and it might be over here. And I might pick another value, it might be way out here. So unlikely to happen, but still possible. So these are all possible values that I could get. These are all possible values that I could get if I was just sort of sampling one person or one individual from this population. Okay. What would the average of the sample means be, All right? Well, let's think this first. Before we tackle this question, where would the sample means be? So, where, so in general, so where would the sample means fall? Now, we know that we might end up with values, we might end up with values that are way down here occasionally or values way up here, but how likely is it do you think that we're gonna find, if we take a large sample from this population, how likely is it that our, 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 the average is gonna be way down here? or the average will be way up here. Where will the means be? Probably a lot closer. So we, we'd still expect some variability, but they probably would not vary anywhere near as much, and we'd probably expect them to be, now, now they might be a little higher sometimes, but they'd probably be clustered a lot more closely here. And it's, it's un, so remember, if it's rare to get this one person, it's probably even rare to get lots of the, those people to end up with a mean that would be way up here. So that's the one. So now, now, so we kind of think that they're going to cluster closer, but what would the average? So if I took lots and lots of these X bars, what would the average be? What do you think the average of the sample means would be? Good. It's a good place to start. So the average of the means, we think would probably, would probably be close or equal to the actual population average. Now, again, we've sort of already talked through this idea, but then what, what can we say then about, about the variation of the sample means? Well, we, we've kind of already said it a little bit. We've said that they, they're still gonna vary, but they're, they're, we still expect there to be random variation. That's an idea of sampling error, but we probably don't expect it to be so extreme we probably don't expect it to be so extreme that they vary a lot. They don't, so we might get ex rare outlier, the occasional outlier in the tails 
when we took, talk to one person, but the idea of getting a sample out there becomes much, much, much less likely. So we have this intuitive idea that the variation of the sample means isn't quite as extreme as the variation of the actual population. Uh, yep, so the, the average of the averages, we'd kind of expect to focus around, uh, when we're taking sample averages, we'd expect them to be pretty close to the population average. While we might occasionally get these few outliers that are way out here, the likelihood of getting enough outliers to push the sample average out to here is unlikely. Okay. So, we expect, so we expect this variability in the population, but only this variability in the sample mean. The variance is probably gonna be smaller. Okay, so I'd like you to think about your loose change. All right. Now, I usually do this in a classroom when I have this conversation. So we talk about the people in the front row, and we talk about everybody in the class, and we talk about all the classrooms on that floor, and then everybody in the building. Um, so, but let's just think about this. Let's say that we have, we're asking uh, just people that we encounter, we're saying, uh, hey, how much loose change do you actually have on you right now? We want to take the average, uh, and we want to we record the average. All right. So let's say we start with, let's say we start with, um, N equals five people. We get a hold of five people and we ask them, um, how much change do you have on you right now? And we take the average of those five people. Okay. And then we do the same thing, but then we sort of bump it up a bit and we have more people. So then let's say we do the same process, but we do it with a group of 25 people. And there's what you'd expect in about a classroom. So that group has, has an average amount of loose change on them. Then we could ask, well, let's say, well, uh, let's look at everybody who's on the floor right now. Let's, let's say we're looking at, looking at 150 people. And then last but not least, let's say we ask, what is, let's say we've got a group of uh, 500 people and we ask how much loose change they have on them. So everybody's gonna report their answer and then we'll take an average of those values. And my question is this for you. Which of these do you expect to be closer to the population average of the amount of loose change that everybody has on their person at any one time. How do people feel about that? Do other, do other people feel, agree with that or, or not, not comfortable going with that answer? So there is some mu, so there's some mu, there, this mu exists, okay, we don't know what it is, that's kind of why we're doing this process of talking to people, say, hey, how much loose change do you have on you? So we're trying to get this value. Now, here's the interesting part, so we, we would kind of expect that if I took that, that group of five, we could expect that the mean might be way out here, okay? But then we would expect as we get more in the, the sample that we would expect that it would probably get closer to the actual population average. But even still, there's still variability at play here. There's still some amount of variability, and it could be the case that, that sometimes we get very, very close, and even with a larger sample, we might end up a little further away. Even with a larger sample, we could st still end up a bit away. But the point is, most people sort of feel comfortable saying that this one is probably the best option because it's the largest sample. And, and that intuitively is, is exactly correct. And that is actually the underlying, that's the underlying motivation behind all of statistics, all right? And, it's, and it's, an intuitive, it's an intuitive aspect. Now, we've given it a fancy title and we've given it uh, some fancy notation to go with it, but it's meant to capture that, that conceptual idea that most people intuitively already know. Next, we will introduce the central limit theorem which is often abbreviated CLT. I argue the central limit theorem is as important, if not more important, than most of the famous theorems m many people know. For example, you probably are familiar with the formula E equals MC squared. Some would argue the discovery of this formula changed the very fabric of the world in which we live. Another common one that most students know is Pythagorean's theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, or the sums of the squares of the sides of a right triangle equal the square of the hypotenuse. A pretty important finding. It revolutionized geometry and our ability to do things like build pyramids and locate our position at sea. Lots of important formulas. But I would argue that the central limit theorem should rank 
in the top 10 formulas or theorems of all times, if not actually hold the highest position on that list. Without this formula, our current society wouldn't even make sense. We simply never would have gotten to where we are without a concrete understanding and exploitation of this theorem. A bit of statistical history here. As important theorems go, it is interesting to note that this was only proven in the 1920s, less than a century ago. While earlier proofs of variations of the central limit theorem had been around since the early 1800s, the more formal proofs were not discovered until last century. There are three parts to this theorem, and we will see that they build naturally on the intuition we just discussed. The first part is that the mean of the sample means, which we will denote as mu sub x bar, the mean of the sample means equals the population mean, which we just call mu. So the average of the sample means equals the population average. This is the formal way to state that the average of the averages is the average. The second part of the theorem has to do with the standard deviation of the sample means and the standard deviation of the population. We will start with the standard deviation of the sample means, which we denote as sigma sub x bar. Again, the subscript x bar is just to emphasize that we are talking about the sampling distribution for the sample means, just as it was with mu sub x bar, the mean of the sample means. Now we want to compare this to the standard deviation of the population, sigma. Intuitively, we expect that the variation of the means will be less than the variation of the overall population. The intriguing part about this is that there is actually a nice formula. The standard deviation of the sample means equals sigma divided by the square root of the sample size. So not only is it less than, and not only does it get smaller as n gets larger, but it gets smaller in a very predictable fashion. These are the first two parts of the central limit theorem. And here's the third part. As n gets bigger, the distribution of the sample means gets more and more normal. Uh, this is important, but it's important to note that I actually didn't say anything about the original population. In particular, I didn't say anything about the original population being normal or not, though I did start our discussion with a bell-shaped curve. So whether I'm starting with a normal distribution or not, the first two rules hold, no matter what the original population distribution looks like. And if I do start with a normal distribution, then the means will be normally distributed regardless of the sample size. But if I start with any other shaped distribution, as n gets bigger and bigger, the distribution of the sample means gets more and more normal. Why is this important? Well, this kind of suggests that I only need to know about normal distributions. Because if my samples are large enough, the populations from which the sample statistics come are actually not that important. So if I start with a population that might be skewed, I don't need to worry about it, because if I take a large enough sample, the sampling distribution becomes more and more normal. I introduced some notation here, but I kind of want to summarize the notation all in one spot. Um, so let's focus on the notation for a bit. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm talking about sampling distributions, but I'm technically talking about sampling distributions of sample means, because you can talk about a sampling distribution for any statistic. The mean of a sample is just the statistic for the sample. I could talk about the sampling distribution for the standard deviation or any number of any statistic you might want. All right, so let's start with the following. All right, so let's start with the population mean and then the sample mean. All right, so for the population mean, the notation for the population mean, we've already seen that one. The notation for the sample mean, we've seen that. For the population mean, the notation we use is, is mu. And for the sample mean, we usually use either x with a bar over it, so x bar, or, or if we're using sort of like the APA format, it would be capital M. And then the notation we use for the mean of the means, so that notation, so again, already introduced it, but just to reiterate it here. So that is usually mu sub x bar. Mu with a subscript of the x bar. All right, everything again for the, so now if we do the same thing for the standard deviation, So for the population standard deviation, we know that we just use the sigma. If we're talking about the sample standard deviation, the sample standard deviation, we talk about S, lowercase s or capital SD. And then the standard deviation of the sample means, we use the notation sigma
Okay, again, which is also known as the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Sampling distribution. Okay, so notation used for this is sigma sub x bar. All right, so I've already kind of introduced those, but this actually has, so this has, this is so important. This, this concept uh, proves to be so important. It actually has its own name in statistics. So this is referred to as the standard error of the mean. So the standard error, in this case, it's the standard error of the mean. And sometimes it is actually abbreviated as SEM. Okay, so this concept, this, this variable here, very important. Okay, this is referred to as the standard error of the mean or just generally the standard error. All right, so that's the notation for the central limit theorem and some of the vocabulary that you're going to encounter. Okay, so you should be able to see the, the graphic here. All right. So the thing to remember with the central limit theorem is that, so the, the blue curve, what we see in the blue curve, the blue curve is the actual population. The distribution of the sampling the sample means, the distribution of the sample means is this growing curve. As the sample gets larger and larger, what we see is the curve gets spikier and spikier and, and, and more centralized around, around the actual population mean. All right. So one of the things to keep in mind is that we often draw the curves the same, but we're really talking about different distributions. The blue curve is the distribution of the population. The, the, the moving curve is the different distributions for the sample means. This is the sampling distribution. This is the, the, the population distribution. It's really important to remember that they are not the same thing. So I, I can't stress that enough, that, that we are actually talking about different distributions. So the population has a distribution, and the sampling distribution has a distribution. <laughs> and, and they both might be normal, but they're not the same. They both might be normal, but they're not the same distribution. They are related to each other. They are, the, the, the distributions are related, but they're not the same, okay? okay so I'll just kind of, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. All right, uh, you should be able to access these in module 12. So what I wanna do is, so what we have here is, this is my population down here. So this blue curve is the population, okay? And what I wanna do, and it's, it's, in this case, it's just a standard normal distribution. So a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And what we're asking here is, what is the probability of getting a score of 0.8 or higher? All right, so that's what we're asking down here. Okay. Sorry. So here, this is a sample. So now we're taking samples of size three from this population. And we're asking, what is the probability that the mean is greater than 0.8? And then the, the spike your picture up here is then for a sample size of seven. So we have n equals three. We have that the mean equals zero and the standard deviation equals one, meaning we know it's a standard normal distribution. So with this here says that we're starting, our population is a standard normal distribution. What I wanna know is what I'm actually looking for, and I believe it was in purple, uh, sorry, I believe it was in, uh, so the value I was looking for is actually in green. So I'll do it in green here. So I want to know what is the probability of getting a sample mean uh, greater than or equal to 0.8. Sample mean greater than or equal to 0.8. Now, what's important here is that I know that the mean of the means equals the population mean, which equals zero. I also know that the standard error of the means equals the standard deviation of my initial population divided by the square root of the sample size. In this case, that would be one over the square root of three. Now I could punch this in, but it turns out I don't actually need to calculate this value because Excel will do this for me. So if I wanted the area to the right of this, well, I, I know how to get this. This is just using, so using Excel, this would be equals one minus, because it's to the right, norm dist, parenthesis. I'm looking for the value of 0.8. So I want 0.8. Okay. 
okay? And my mean is still zero, but my standard deviation is not one, but it's one over the square root of three. So I'll, do, I'll use the square root function, SQRT. That gives the square root of the number in Excel. And again, we always say true. Punch this into Excel and we get the value. This turns out to be a point. I don't know why so many decimal places written. 8293, 833, dot, 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 dot. All right, so if I jump back here for a second, we jump back to the handout. All right, so what we just calculated, let me see if I can actually write this. So this is n equals three and the probability for this is 8.3%. Now, the other important thing to note is what we just calculated was x bar. This is, this is the probability of the mean being greater than or equal to 0 0.8 for a sample size of three. Now, technically, if I did the same thing down here, if I did the same thing down here for the original curve, for the blue curve, so we did the same thing down here, I, I could write it as a sample size of one, but but we, that, that's not, I mean, we don't think of one as a sample size. So we're saying, what's the probability that the score is larger than, than 0.8? And since I know this is a normal distribution, I could just do one minus norm s dist 0.8 to get the value here. And the probability here is 21.2%. Now using Excel, if I go back to Excel and I replace the formula that I punched in with a three and I just punch in the value seven, so if I just come back up here and I punch in n equals uh, square root of seven instead of the square root of three, hopefully brown, n equals seven. So in that case, if I punch it in, I get a probability of 1.7%. Uh, so this is, this is, this takes us to, to one of the extremely important parts of, of the work with the central limit theorem. And that is that we need to keep track of what type of, of value are we talking about. So <clears throat> let me show you what I mean by that. So when we're talking about an individual, for example, we're usually talking about a score or, or something, a single value or observation. When we're talking about samples, we're almost always talking about the sample mean. So we usually refer to the fact it's a sample, we refer to the fact it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, that there's a mean that we're looking at. So the key is that the, for the first example, we're asking a question that looks like this. What is the probability of a score of one or two or larger? And this is very, very different from asking the probability of a sample mean of one or two or larger. Let's look at the formula for these two. All right, so this area here, so the area shaded here is actually 44 point, so this area here is 44.7% of the total area. So that's the same as this value down here. So this is 44.7%. I'll give the Excel function for that in just a moment. And what we notice is though that the probability of a mean of one or two or higher that's noticeably less. That's noticeably less. So the mean of uh, getting a mean of one or two or higher is only 7.2% chance. Now again, let's, let's walk this through. So what, what we're having here is that we're looking at the Sanford Binet IQ test. Average is 100, standard deviation is 15. We have an individual with an IQ of 102 or greater. So if the, ind so the probability of that happening, 102 is greater than half, so it's less than 50, it's greater than the mean. So it's less than half, but it's pretty close, all right? Whereas the probability of getting a sample of 120 individuals with an average IQ of 102 or higher, that decreases in probability down to 7.2%. So let's look at these functions in Excel. So the first one in Excel would be equals one minus norm dist 102 comma, I'm gonna write these values in here in a second comma, true, okay? In this case, we have the values, <clears throat> we're taking the values from the population, and we know the values from the population are 100 for the mean, and 15 for the standard deviation, okay? 
and that's where we got the value. So that's how I got the value point. So if I put that in, that's where the 44, uh, 44, 0.447 comes from. Right. Now doing the same thing in Excel for the sample size. So the next version of this would be, so much of it starts the same, obviously. So equals one minus norm dist, starting with the value 102. All right, so the structure now looks like this. So I'm still putting in the population value of 100 for the mean, because that hasn't changed. And that's, that's true regardless of my sample size. But what changes specific for my sample is that now it's 15 over the square root of, divided by SQRT parenthesis 120. That's what gives me the value point. 0.72 or 7.2 percent. Now again, I cannot stress this enough. I cannot stress it enough. Both curves are normal, but they are not the same curve. So let me kind of let me try to highlight it over here on the graph. If I scroll down here, we see that we actually have two different curves. This is the curve of the population distribution. Those are all the possible IQ scores for any one individual. This is the curve of the sampling distribution. They definitely, you definitely can see that they really, really are not the same curve. So here's the end of class question for this part. So we have that the mean for our population is 40. We have that the standard deviation for our population is 30. And we have that the sample size is 25. So this is the information for the population. We have a sample size of 25. What I would like to know, the end of class question is, what is the sample mean, the mean of the means? That's part one. Part two, what is the standard error for the sample means or the standard error of the mean?